Hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in tonight. It is a dreary October evening, and it's been rainy and gross, well, pretty much all day, but I hope you're inside. I hope that everything is nice and comfortable, and you're excited about studying John chapter 13 with me. I hope you've got your Bible ready and that you have already gone to our church's website and you've downloaded your study guide for tonight's lesson. A couple of weeks ago, we started studying the last week of Christ's life. We, we started talking about the anointing at Bethany, and tonight it's time to talk about Jesus washing the apostles' feet in John chapter 13. So here's what I'd like to do. We're going to study the first 30 verses of that chapter. We're going to look at it in two sections, the first 17 verses first, and then from 18 to 30 second. On your handout, there's going to be about, oh, seven or eight blanks for you to fill in. We'll talk about those blanks, and we'll be able to speak about the subject and the content of this story as we go. But before we begin, I just want to ask you a question. Are you a servant? Now, prove it. If I were to put you on trial and accuse you of being a servant, how many people could come to your defense and say, well, they did this for me, and they did that for me, and this was done, that was done, and they would go on and on and on and on. Are you a servant, and can it be proven? You don't have to wash someone's feet. You don't have to do the lowest of jobs to be a servant. But Jesus shows us something here. Outside of the cross, this is probably the greatest moment of humility that God ever displays. And he does it by proving to us a point. To be divine means you're a servant. So if we are going to be Christ-like, if that image that we possess not just sounds like him, but is like him, then we will say we care and show we care. So go with me to John chapter 13. Let's read the first 17 verses. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus said, If you do not, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon said, Lord, not my feet only then, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taking his garments, sat down again, he said to them, You know what I have done to you. You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now, there aren't a lot of blanks on your handout today, but to help guide us and to understand what it is we must see, notice a few things. Starting with verse 2, letter A on your handout. That it was the devil who put into Judah's heart the temptation to betray Jesus. The devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness. The devil tempts you and I. And just like Jesus, who stood up to him and the devil fled from him, you and I can do the same. But Judas did it. Judas, like too many of us, let the devil get close. Let the devil whisper into his ear. Let the devil turn his heart and take him away from God and towards something selfish and temporary. God, who sat in front of him, Emmanuel, Jesus, it, it literally means God with us. Yet Judas was so focused on money, power, betrayal, 
but he couldn't see the divine washing his very feet. We get very myopic. We get very concerned and focused on what's right in front of me. And, and we almost develop blinders where we can't see anything else around us, including God's work. That's the devil. That's his playground. And the most opportunistic time he takes to tempt you and me. When we're so busy thinking of ourselves, we stop thinking about others and we stop thinking about God. Letter D on your handout. What I want you to know about what Jesus did is that washing feet... <coughs> Excuse me. Washing feet was a servant's job. Not the job of a rabbi. Later he says, you call me teacher and Lord, yet I'm washing your feet. You should have washed mine is what he's saying. I shouldn't have washed yours, but I'm giving you an example that you may know the greatest in the kingdom is the least. The mightiest is the servant. And the most respected is not the one first in line, but last in line. I do this so that you will know what to do for one another. We should outdo one another, Scripture says. Outdo one another in good deeds. Our, our love, our care, our concern for each other should be overwhelming. And I know it might be difficult to do that now under the circumstances of the pandemic. But you can still call, you can still text, you can still pray, you can still be concerned. And when there are moments, you can still go serve. Be that person. Because our Savior was that person. I want you to notice that once again, it's Simon Peter, his letter C on your handout, who speaks up. The man just couldn't let a situation unfold without offering his input. And I'd like to know how many had their feet washed before Jesus got to them. And I'd like to know how long he had thought, well, when Jesus gets here, I won't let him do that to me. I, I don't want to demean his character. But have you ever, have you ever known a person that waited for the right time to say the wrong thing? So that it made them look better than anyone else? Of course you have. Could there be a bit of that going on here? Maybe. Maybe. But maybe it's just Peter reacting instead of listening. Sometimes we are so busy trying to explain what's happening that we don't just stop, be still, and know that God is in control. Over the last few months, I've prayed that God would make things obvious. Because so many things are not. Just show me what's right, what, what's necessary, what makes sense. That's what I've asked for. Some things he's been very clear about. I haven't asked it to be easy. I just want to know what's the right choice. I pray that that's true for all of us. That when Jesus comes up to our feet, that we sit back and let him walk because it's the right thing to do. And then we take our turn washing his. Letter D on your handout shows us something fascinating. Verse 12 says that when he had washed their feet, he got up. Who does that include? Well, that includes Judas Iscariot. So you're to tell me that he washed that mangy scoundrel's feet. And the answer is an emphatic yes. What can you do to the person who betrays you? What are you willing to do to the person who sells your life for something insignificant? And what would you do to the person who hurts you worse than anyone else? Would you serve them? Would you avoid them? Would you pay them back? I don't believe serve them is the answer most of us would naturally give. Paying them back, ignoring them, would probably be what we want to do. Jesus knew what Judas was about to do. He washed his feet and went. Wash the feet of even your worst enemy and those who betray you the most because that's what our Savior was willing to do. Turn to verse 18. Read with me to the end of our section today, verse 30. He said, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but... That the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, 
you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit, testified, and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about who he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore mentioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus said, It is he. That would mean the one who will betray me. It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. Some thought, because Judas had the money box, that Jesus said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Having received the piece of bread, Judas went out immediately, and it was not his. Now, just from my point of view with perspective, I'm sure from your point of view of perspective as well, why is it confusing to them? Why do they not know what's going on? And I, I don't know the answer emphatically, but, but we'll, we'll make an assumption here in just a moment. Before we get there, I want you to notice something. Letter E. Jesus quoted from Psalm 41 and verse 9 when he referred to Jesus. He who eats bread with me. So it had to be one of these men who would betray him. Now that seems, I don't know, contrary to about everything we know. Why would you bring someone in to your inner circle, your, your friends, if you knew they'd betray you? Because of the scripture. Because of the prophecy. Because that is what God had put in place. Did it have to be Judas? No. But it had to be one of them. Did Judas then have to kill himself? No. He didn't. And he could have been forgiven. And I make the statement that he would have been the greatest preacher the world ever saw. Because he could have stood up and said, I betrayed Jesus myself. I held the 30 pieces of silver, yet he forgave me. You want to talk about standing up and saying, I'm the chief of sinners. Paul would have had no argument had Judas been able to say anything. And if you want to believe no one is beyond forgiveness, do you think Jesus wouldn't have forgiven Judas? You know he would have. I know he would have. I wish Judas would have known that as well. Letter F, I want you to notice how blunt Jesus is with them, how, how honest, how direct he is with them. That's your blank. He, he didn't mince words. He said, one of you will betray me. I'm shocked there was still confusion after that. <laughs> when he dipped the bread, handed it to Judas, and Judas left the room, I'm shocked that there was any confusion. I'm shocked that as it happened, Peter, James, and John didn't stand up, grab him by the neck, and say, where are you going? They didn't know what was happening, yet Jesus speaks so clearly. I would ask you the question, why? Well, letter G, when Jesus gives Judas the piece of bread, why didn't they know? The only answer I can come to is this. They couldn't imagine Judas would do what he did. No way in their mind was that a possibility. What, what do you mean you're going to sell him to the Jewish people? What do you mean you're going to, you're going to sell him and, and, and pay a slave's price for him? What do you mean you're going to tell them where he is so they can arrest him? I think it was inconceivable to quote my favorite uh, movie as a child. They just never imagined it was possible. Finally, notice that even though the other 11 don't seem to have it figured out, Jesus and Judas knew what the piece of bread meant. He got up and he went to betray the Savior. There's a lot we can unpack, but I think the key to me are two things. Number one, if God's a servant, you have no reason not to be. No excuse not to be. And number two, If you let Satan into your heart, into your head, and into your ears, you will become more of your life than even God is. And if Satan becomes a part of your life, you can literally 
eat dinner with God. You can watch God wash your dirty mangy feet. And then you can go betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Two significant lessons from this story. Be a servant and resist the devil. Do those things, my friends. You'll be Christ-like and you'll avoid the mistake that Judas made when you listen to the devil instead of listening to God. I'm so very thankful that you have taken the time to watch tonight. Tonight's lesson is purposely a bit shorter because of the impact of these two stories. Next week we'll finish chapter 13. We'll look at chapter 14 when Jesus makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we will unpack what that means. Thank you for watching. I pray this has been a blessing to you and that on this damp, dreary fall Wednesday, you and your family will be